Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm so excited to have everyone join us today. Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot to do today, so I won't take up too much time. I'll just say thank you to all our guests and friends and speakers who have honored us with their presence today. And I will <clears> turn <throat> over to Kate, who's going to kick us off. And I'm going to go ahead and try to mute us all. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, kia ora, everyone. I'm the uh, Executive Director of the Global Island Partnership, which is uh, an island, and also I'm an Island Conservation Advisory Council member. I also want to recognise that Island Conservation is a valued member of our partnership, the Global Island Partnership, so we really appreciate having them kind of in our team. I previously spent 10 years working on biodiversity strategy development with Pacific Island countries um, in Apia Samoa with SPREP. And I'm going to be talking to the theme of today, which is protecting biodiversity, celebrating culture through my own Pacific cultural lens. So the next bit is slightly different than that last bit. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. So hello everybody there and warm greetings to you all. Ko moa o to manga, ko tauranga to moana, ko mata tua to waka, ko naitarangi te iwi, Ko Tamapore Te Marae, ko Cape Brown Taku Ingohoa. That was my prepare or formal introduction, which is used in my culture, Māori culture, as a formal greeting. And it helps people to identify you. And importantly, it's through this that it links me to my ancestors. It identifies who I am, where I'm from, and where I belong. Um, and these are the critical parts of understanding Pacific culture. Our ancestors are important. We build on what they've done before and we honor them and we respect them and future generations through our actions. So if we looked at my pepea, it was identifying the mountain I, I identify with, the waters I identify with, the canoe that my ancestors came on, the tribe that I'm part of, and the marae that I identify with. The last line is my name, because it's probably the least important part of this introduction. Um, and I think the idea, um, we're explaining not just me as an individual, but me as part of a community, which is an important underpinning of Pacific culture. I speak to my canoe, Mata Tua, which is the canoe my ancestors arrived in New Zealand on around 800 years ago. And so we still talk about it every time we introduce ourselves. This is from the great migrations that populated all of these islands across the Pacific. This connects me to the other island cultures in the region through the ability of our ancestors to move through this vast Pacific Ocean, using the stars and the ocean to navigate with purpose. In some parts of the region, including those places we are talking about today, this is still part of their lived culture. In others, there is a distinct revival underway as we forgot our ability to do this with colonialism and modernity. What we remember from this though, is our Pacific people have a culture of discovery and exploration, of courage and resilience and innovation. This topic of protecting biodiversity is really dear to my heart. Um, I organized a conference in 2008 in Papua New Guinea <clears throat> for the whole region with the theme of conservation serving communities. Because in our region, culture and the people, it is the heart of any efforts to protect biodiversity. And what does that mean? It means that most land, natural resources and biodiversity in this region is owned by indigenous and local communities. And in some places that's up to 97% of the, of the country. And that any conservation efforts must address these communities' aspirations for development and well-being. It recognizes that well-being in this context is culturally underpinned. It recognizes that a Pacific approach to conservation will be based on sustainable resource use. <clears throat> From a cultural standpoint also, many of these places, it's why we identify them, have a sacred religious and spiritual aspect. For me, in our landscape behind me, I can tell you stories of how the mountains were formed, how the rivers were formed using legends and stories. This is our cultural inheritance and in perpetuating this culture structures and identity is an important responsibility that we have. Just like with my introduction, this connection to place is important to culture. Another aspect is that we have a responsibility and a guardianship over these places and over our biodiversity. This is really different than the Western idea of ownership or of dominion with land under customary ownership. 
it means that we must uh, we're responsible for it we must be guardians we are building on what our ancestors left and we are connecting that to our future descendants these elements make our culture in this region one we live in one which is adapting to pressures like colonialism's legacy and some of the modern threats that we face climate change invasive species ocean acidification to name a few Protecting biodiversity in this region will always need to be rooted in what are the aspirations and needs of Pacific people. People have an enormous responsibility, but one which they are very much used to bearing and whom I think have many lessons for the rest of the world. I'm excited that this story continues to be told because that is very much our culture to, to share the stories, to tell the stories, and that they're being uplifted and celebrated as they undertake this really important work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ali, everyone, can you hear me? Hello? Ali? Ali, we can Lori, hear, we, we can Ali, hear you. Sorry, Ali, sorry. Ali, it's kind of delayed, so <laughs> I thought I was disconnected. Okay, so my name is uh, Loyola Darius. I'm known as Loy. I'm the uh, Palau Program Manager for Island Conservation here in Palau. Uh, before I take you on a tour around Palau, I would like to do a chant. It's a, can we go to the next slide? It's a chant about a uh, fruit bat. Uh, the literally uh, translation means um, so bat is a good person that it, uh, when it seeks for is a good mother that it takes its pub everywhere when they go look for food so this is just to enforce and uh, emphasize the role and the responsibilities of mothers as they take care of their their, their child so and uh, for this I will need everyone's participation so when I raise my hand can everybody see me uh everyone would say um hui i hope it's like uh so i'm gonna Here. start there yeah? yeah okay oh the swak oh the swak le la am ungil ada o li el diklo wak rang al gel mas el El mo mga udu ide, emel nga lak le la bo de siya. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Loy, I'm gonna mute everyone again, so you'll have to unmute yourself. But just a moment. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so Ali and welcome everyone. Uh, glad you arrived safely in Palau, your destination. And I would like to take you on a tour around Palau, but we'll go on a boat. So be prepared, put your life jacket on. And, but before we depart, I just wanna share a few um, general information about Palau. We're an archipelago of 600 islands. We're part of the Micronesian region of the Western Pacific Ocean. Uh, our capital is uh, located in the main island of Babeldaab. Uh, we have a population of 17,000 people and we do spoke both Palawan and English. And I just wanna share you how we got the name Belau. It's actually Belau, but people say Palau. It's from the word Melau, to trick or lie. There's a legend about Awab, a giant demigod from Angar, a southwest, uh, one of the South Islands. He, grew, he was a, a boy and he grew up so fast every day he became, he was growing so fast, the local people didn't know what to do with him. So they tricked him, like uh, they say, go to sleep and we'll look for food. But when once he fell asleep, they tied him and burned him. So when he fell down, he formed the islands, the, the larger islands of uh, Babel Dao, the main island. So you can see the bigger island, they say that's the body of Awab. So I just wanted to share you uh, that. 
And so moving on, uh, for ICs present in Palau, it dates back to 2011, but uh, the office was established in 2017. Uh, our vision is for Palau to, and uh, for the people of Palau and by the biodiversity be thriving without any worrying about invasive species. So yes, being part of the team, growing up, I didn't realize the local communities uh, dependent on local crops were suffering because of invasive species such as rats. So being part of the team has made me realize about the impacts uh, that, that invasive species can have. So I want to share with you my first uh, project with island conservation teams. So I would like to take you on a journey to the Kayangal Atoll. Yeah. Yes, so this is Kayangal. It's an atoll, 25 nautical miles away from the main island of Babaldab. Here it's uh, susceptible to storms and uh, its reef uh, protects its, uh, uh, its fortress eh? and the food crops are vital for survival during storms because it gets rough so it's hard for people to go back to the main island. So there's uh, about 60 permanent uh, residents here in the island their main uh, produce is uh, coconut oil and pandanus, uh, woven pandanus products. Uh, they, it's a very special community because they still strongly uh, practice their local uh, traditions and abiding their taboos. So those were some of the challenges when we had project, uh, there were uh, sacred areas. So we partnered up with um, uh, Palau Conservation uh, Society, Birth Life, uh, Kayangal Youth uh, Association to uh, remove rats from the islands. And because the, uh, the rats had great impacts on crops such as corn, as you can see, and bananas. So Kayangal is, uh, Kayangal's identity is banana. So when we first arrived at the island, we didn't see, we saw bananas, but they couldn't, re they couldn't harvest because the rats got to them before the people did. So they were kind of, that was kind of missing part of uh, the Kayang. I just wanted to show you, like you can see the bananas and, and the matriarch overseeing their crops like the other, the other uh, uh, slides. And um, I wanted to share you how happy after the, uh, the project, the, when we removed the rats, they started, they were able to, uh, can we go to the next slide? To harvest their their crops and enjoy their island is a part of, so this is also, uh, this is our giant uh, taro, the yellow ones, not the purple ones. These uh, grow very well in Kayama because it has a good soil. And I just wanted to show you the happy faces when they, uh, the, when they started the recovering their crops, I see another banana. And uh, the last slide is Kayangal today. Uh, this was a recent, uh, uh, so this is how it is today. You can imagine uh, they can harvest so much bananas and uh, showcase uh, and show off their culture to other people. So I see played an important role of uh, removing Asian rats and teaching the community about biosecurity and uh, so that they won't return back to Kayangal. We also uh, assist in making legislation so that they can uh, ensure visitors take precautions before arriving in their islands. So that's uh, Kayangal and uh, celebrating their culture. And now our next stop we're going to travel again on boat and we'll be going south. Yes, to Oolong, to the, uh, we're going to make a stop at the Rock Island Southern uh, Lagoon, UNESCO site, World Her uh, Heritage Site. And uh, we'll take a tour. We'll be passing one of the IC's first pilot project, the, one of the Rock Islands, Ngayang. So, but we'll make it, we'll be making a stop at Oolong. Oolong is a, is uh, an important uh, cultural site for Palau. It's recorded one of the earliest uh, settlements in Palau. It still has its traditional village. It's uh, uh, also on the cliff, there's petroglyphs on the side of the, the, the islands. Uh, it, uh, 
It's also where uh, Captain Wilson repaired his ship when he got shipwrecked on the reef of uh, Ulong. It's, uh, you can also find endangered megapode, Bagay, there. And it's a seasonal tourist area, depending on the tides. And then uh, fishing is also permitted uh, uh, there uh, uh, in certain parts of the, the islands. So our mission is to remove both rats and cats from the islands to recover the seabird and landbird population. So the Rock Islands are located at Kotor State. So IC and Kotor State have built a strong partnership to work together to, so that the project uh, will succeed. Yeah, so you can, well, I guess we won't have time to swim today in the Rock Islands because we, we do have to catch the next uh, uh, live aboard because we're going to be traveling overnight over to the Sonsorol Islands. Yes, so this is uh, the map of Sonsorol. Sonsorol is a future project for, for island conservation if we, find, uh, if we can find funding. And um, so the one with the mark is, it's located way down south of Palau. It's, uh, it's 100 kilometers southwest of Palau. And then it comprise it comprise of uh, four islands: Sonsorol, Fana, Meril, and Puloana. So these islands are scarily e separated, and they were first settled like more than five hundred years ago by uh, voyagers from traveling from uh, the Federal States of Micronesia. So they do ha they have different language. They speak different language and they also have different uh, traditions from the main island. So each island, there used to be a lot of people living in the islands, but because of typhoons and rats and uh, coconut rhinos uh, beetles, the people, uh, some people decided to migrate to the main island of Palau. So as you can see, the next slide, this is the coconut syrup processing. It's, uh, this is one of their main source of income, but because it's, uh, it's at risk because of the coconut rhinos and rats have gotten to them. So the production has slowed down or in some of the islands also have stopped uh, making because uh, they're not able to um, succeed. And next slide. So as you can see, the uh, presence of rats, uh, the local people depended more on imported goods, uh, which also can cause non-communicable disease. And uh, if nothing is done, uh, what can they do? Like, uh, so what the community did, uh, some, they got some assistance from uh, the national government providing uh, other plants such as uh, uh, breadfruit, you can see on the next slide to help uh, for food security and uh, to help because even uh, they also have like sweet potatoes but the rats get to them uh, faster than the locals so they cannot harvest the, their their crops as well so yes uh, if nothing changed they'll be forced to move out of the islands and uh, one by one, they will leave the, the islands. And as you can see, the next slide, there is a, uh, next slide. so these are the young children enjoying their, if nothing, if nothing's done, they then will be forced to move out of their islands. So Sonsoro Islands and Palau and the rest of Palau needs our help and uh, we want to work together to look for funding to help the communities retain their identity and also protecting their biosecurity so they can continue celebrating their culture. So thank you everyone for visiting Palau. Hope you enjoy the boat ride around Palau and I hope to see you next time.
And um, for our speakers, you can un unmute yourself. I have yeah. everyone muted. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Rulmal, and I'm from Ulithi. I'm from the islands of Ulithi. Uh, so we'll continue on the journey from Sansarol. We will be moving uh, towards uh, Yap and in the Ulithi Islands. Let's see, this is not moving. Um, why is it not moving? Junior is not able to advance his slides. Did you click on the slide? Looks like it's doing something now. No. Well, anyway, my respects to all of you um, that's present here today. Thank you so much for, for having us and for allowing us to share a little bit of our story with you and our home with you. So thank you. I'll be sharing with, uh, with my colleagues, Nicole and Tommy. Let's see. Okay, wait, sorry, I'm a little bit late here, but it's getting there. Okay, welcome to Ulithi. Um, we, we boarded, uh, got off the liveaboard from, uh, from Sansaral and we got into a nine passenger airplane and we're now flying to one of the world's largest lagoons. Uh, Ulithi et al. and we will be landing on Falalup in just about a minute. So uh, please fasten your seat belt, sit back and um, enjoy the little island of Falalup. So we're landing here on Falalap, Ulithi. This is one of the four of the inhabited islands of Ulithi Atoll. Ulithi consists of about uh, 39 islands and only four inhabited. Uh, so this, this few slides is just going to show you um, a little bit of our culture and history. Uh, despite having to be one of the staging, important staging areas of World War II uh, for the invasion of Japan, Ulithi today still is very steep in tradition and culture and uniquely have its own um, language. Um, so this is uh, some of the homes you can see throughout, not just Ulithi, but the outer island chain. Yep, we still have canoes. We came on a nice nine passenger plane, but we're still using canoes every now and then. Um, so, yeah. So this is just to give you an idea of the stretch of islands here. So we're up uh, top Ulithi Atoll there, and we stretch over about a, an area of 500 miles uh, with a combined uh, land, square footage of only seven square miles but an area, ocean area of, of some 100 square, square miles. So it is a watery world as my mentor and colleague, uh, Nicole calls it. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna focus our discussion on Ulithi et al. Um, there's, uh, like I said, there's about 39 islands here and only four are inhabited. Maumok at the very top you can see is the home of our paramount chief. Uh, however, each island has their own respective chiefs. The next slide is just going to show you um, some fishing jurisdictions that we have. And my uh, idea here, the point here is to show the complexity and how interconnected um, or interdependent uh, a system, a very complex system of management they have in the outer islands. And I'm so grateful that some of it survived to today. Oh, that's that slide. That is in the very beginning. A few more slides just to show some of the, um, some of the issues we're having. Okay, so this slide, I wanted to highlight the challenges that we're having on Ulithi. Um, you know, whether it's climate change or simple um, 
influence from the outside. We too, like many other outer islands in similar situations, we face the same battle every day for climate change. However, my story today is not one of doomed and dead. Uh, I, I wanted to, to, to make this be a more of a promise and a hope story. So I'm not going to dwell too much on many of the challenges that we have. Um, let's see. So the work, what is the work that we do? Um, as a native of these islands, I've seen very well-intended programs come out and fail because it lack a um, cultural context, I think. And so one of the things we did that's different is we talked, talked, and talk. So if anybody that um, has ever done work in Micronesia, you'll know that, uh, you know, a lot of meetings, long meetings. And so uh, in a very sensitive um, culture, it's not always easy to do that. So we had to, the team, the science team, um, along with the science team, we had to do focus groups, women separately, um, the elders and the youth and, and men, and basically kind of get to know the community and find out what, their, what they think their issues are and what they consider to be an issue and how would we help um, bring some light to that in the face of all of these many other challenges. And so, um, this slide, we wanted to show the contrast um, here, culture and modern. So in the background, you can see a nice yacht that we used only once as our, uh, our, our expedition yacht. Um, but then in the, in, here in the front, you see, you know, the next generation of growing up in a culture that's constantly um, being faced with, 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 with many other cha Western changes. So, uh, but I wanted to focus a little bit on a, a story. What was the game changer? How did we combine, what is the uniqueness of our work? And I think it's all started with um, our, our turtle work. In 2001, thanks to Peace Corps and, and NOAA, we had um, a, a tag and monitor project. We started in Ulithi. And from that project, we, we later realized that Ulithi nesting green sea turtle um, beaches is one of the largest, if not the largest in the region. And that averages about 90 to 100 turtles nesting per night. And so um, what, how, did, how did this nest get protected all these years? I think the credit goes back to the traditions and the, the management, the local ma management. Now, mind you, this is a resource that that we still use today. And so the one example I usually, I wanna, uh, I wanna share with you is basically that we, it took us 10 years to figure out that some of these traditions actually had science base behind it. For instance, um, every season we'll have, uh, the, the locals will, will do a sweep of all the turtle eggs, uh, two to three years old, uh, I'm sorry, two to three days old eggs and those are picked up and shared in the community. Uh, when I ask one elder, you know, why do we go in the months of April, you know, the beginning of the summer season, instead of going, you know, a little bit later in June when there's much more turtles. And the question has been, it's been tradition. You know, it's, it is the way it is. Don't question it, just follow tradition. And so having gone through uh, with the turtle work, we're able to figure out that about 90% of the nest drop pre-season have a very, very low survival rate because in the peak season, most of the turtles will come up and dig up the nest and, and destroy it anyway. So, so that was the one important fact I think for me was a game changer. Like how did they know that this is the best time for harvest? How did they know? And then, um, and then the list goes on. But that curiosity started with the turtle, something I thought is, you know, as complicated as turtle lives, um, you know, to be able to be that close to nature to find, you know, the right time for the harvest. I wonder what else 
what what other taboo tradition has science and and you know real sustainability meaning behind it and so the list goes on and i'll let my colleagues talk a little bit about more of the work we do but i i always enjoy sharing the turtle story because personally for me that was i think the game changer uh, so with that uh, a little bit more turtle image here uh, I will turn over to my colleague and mentor, Nicole Crane. I think you have to click one more, John. Just go. I did. Okay. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody. <laughs> We're in multiple time zones. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to pick up from where John left off and um, take us on a journey, not just to this amazing place, but also through a process that he and I personally, as well as with our colleagues and the entire community, have taken in an adventure that we're calling collaborative conservation. Um, it's, as he mentioned, this is really uh, rather than lecturing to people about what our possible solutions and lecturing to them about what's happening. It's really a dialogue and a conversation. It's a conversation about what the issues are. And importantly, it's a conversation about what they've been doing to solve these problems. These are people who have been living successfully in these islands for a long, long time. So it doesn't seem appropriate to go in there and say, oh, here's some problems I've identified and here's some solutions. So we embarked on this journey um, to have these long, sometimes very long conversations and come collaboratively to some conclusions about what's happening. So here you see um, some of the local fishermen and community members collecting some data on their um, adult parrotfish. So this was one of the stories that really resonated with people. We had noticed a decline in some of the reefs. They had noticed a decline in fish. And together we were able to piece the story of spear guns. Um, which are a relatively novel way of fishing in these islands. Um, they don't catch that many fish, so you're, you might be surprised that they would be seeing declines. So we were able to discuss why those declines were happening and recognize that actually it's because these are fish are sequential hermaphrodites. They become males when they grow up. And so if you're targeting them with spear guns, you're reducing your reproductive capacity. And um, so they were fascinated by those stories. And um, together we recognize that really it's, it's traditional management that will work out here rather than a management plan that we might propose. And so we never did propose management plans and never do. Instead, we shine lights on the ways that they've always managed successfully and what, what has changed. Why are there issues now? And how might we look at those traditional management systems and, and try to see ways to tweak them a bit to make them more effective? So lots of conversations. Um, lots of data collecting. Uh, the people themselves have collected data from over 100,000 fish that they've landed. This is the largest artisanal fishing database in this entire region. It's really unbelievable. Um, so through that database, we're able to, to take a look at, at lots of um, issues. And we also are using genetic approaches and isotopes to look at other issues, in this case, connectivity. They were really curious about how their islands are connected by the fish. Um, and we were able to show them that um, fish that are born on the island of Federai, for example, um, can swim or their brothers and sisters can swim all the way to Falala. So there's a connectivity. So management is connected as well. And this also feeds into the concepts of biosecurity and the removal of invasive species because all of these things are connected. And, and if islands are working together, um, there's a much better chance of success. So we also took a lot of data from the benthos, from the, the coral reef itself. I'm trying to understand what's happening there. And we're super excited working with Island Conservation because this is gonna be one of the only projects that we know of where we have pre and post data from the, the islands where there's eradications happening. So we've been collecting data at 32 sites around Ulithia Atoll for about 10 years. So we have some really nice um, time uh, series of data from the reefs. And now we're gonna be able to show if there's any change uh, pre and post eradication. So that's gonna be very exciting. We're, we're really excited about that. Um, what we found on these reefs is that we do believe and have seen that they're really quite resilient and, and the people have made unbelievable um, uh, steps towards protecting and increasing their biomass. Um, we're also using isotopes. Um, isotopes are gonna be helping us understand 
how um, uh, energy is flowing through the system and from where the carbon and nitrogen are acquired. So seabirds are a part of this um, formula. And uh, I think Tommy's gonna say a couple words about that too. Um, so one of our big um, milestones in our journey, I guess, has, has been this, not just an understanding that management happens in a cultural context, um, but a real living of that idea. So not just an understanding intellectually, but really working with people to try to solve these problems collaboratively. And part of that has been a journey with the youth. And John is very committed to the youth of his communities. Um, we have uh, together worked on a youth program where we're, we're developing youth leaders and have developed some amazing youth leaders, I have to say. <laughs> some very, who I hope some of them are here listening now. Um, and also a National Geographic funded storytelling project where we really wanted to try to collect as many stories as we could that were foundational to the Ulithian people and, and tie those stories to conservation messaging. And what we discovered in this process, which was not surprising to any of them and not to John, but I suppose in some ways surprising to us, um, they don't separate conservation and stories and culture and society, these things are all meshed into one world view for, for them. And so it was really, really exciting to take the storytelling and translate it into Ulithian. Actually, John had to translate it into two different versions of Ulithian because there's the modern day Ulithian and the older day Ulithian. Um, and then translate these into English and then write them out and then give them back to the communities um, and then we developed a story in addition to those which sort of tied some of the main conservation messages into a sort of a more English story. So we, we kind of sort of mesh these two realities. It was a fascinating project. Um, and I think it speaks to what we're doing out there, which is to really have uh, local leaders, local communities drive and lead all of this work through their needs and for us to be the support team for that rather than being the dictators. Um, and the eradication is a piece of that work that we're really excited about. So I'm gonna turn this over to Tommy. All right, thanks Nicole. And thanks Junior and Loy for waking up so early. And hello everyone, my name is Tommy Hall, project manager with Island Conservation. And currently my focus is in the South and West Pacific on projects in Micronesia. I work with Loy closely with Junior on the Ulithi community and, and Nicole with One People, One Reef. So I'm going to uh, continue our journey from the main islands on Ulithi to the projects that we're working on with IC currently. Once I pull the map up so we don't get lost. Give me a minute here. So we'll load up our boats and we'll leave from Philalip, which you've heard about, and we'll head over to the Turtle Islands. The Turtle Islands are five islands that we're calling the Turtle Islands, which are some of the most uh, pristine, undisturbed atoll forest habitat in the area. And as Junior mentioned, also some of the most important, one of the largest green turtle rookeries in Micronesia. So our objective was to remove invasive vertebrate species from all the turtle islands um, to restore and protect them. And after our surveys were wrapped up in 2019, we found that Luciep was in fact the only island with invasive species. And so we began our uh, journey to removing uh, pigs, rats, and monitor lizards that were introduced. So from a lot, Falalip, we'll load onto a couple of the small community boats, and you can believe that we'll do some fishing on the way there. And if you're interested in fishing, you can just ask one of the boys and let you give you a shot to try to pull in a wahoo or a tuna on a hand line, which is exciting. When we get to the island of Luciep, we'll get on, off on the beach, unload our gear, and head up to the field camp. So we were able to build a structure for this project, which was funded by the Darwin Initiative and the Department of Interior Office of Insular Affairs. We built a structure because this was going to be a long-standing project for, with a couple of years including turtle monitoring work, which you heard about, baseline um, surveys, the eradication project, and Luciep is traditionally a garden island for the community. So once we're done, the plan is to resume gardening, traditional gardening and sort of a permaculture approach on the island. The structure will serve as a nice uh, shelter for the folks who come out. So we'll check in with the field team. And of course, we're working with a, a really, really capable group of locals 
Our field team ranges from anywhere from five to 15 people at any time, given the amount of work we're doing. And one of the focuses of our project is to build local capacity so that we we really want to uh, empower and share the, the skills and the body of knowledge around restoration through invasive species eradication. So we're working with the, the youth with the Ulithi Falalip Community Action Program, One People, One Reef, and the community, and then as well as up to at the state level with the uh, YAP Department of Agriculture and the YAP EPA. And we hope to sh continue sh uh, sharing that outward. So it's really a local uh, focus with management up, so outward towards the, the national level. So when you're walking around the island, you can see the destruction from the invasive species. You see nests every morning, especially during peak turtle season, that the nests are being dug up every night. The pigs eat them, the monitors eat them, the rats eat the turtle hatchlings, the monitor lizards eat the turtle hatchling. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's right in front of your face every day. And although COVID kind of held us back this year, we weren't able to implement a lot of the things we wanted to do. The community team was able to complete the pig eradication over the past year. So with pigs gone from Lucia, we can expect the turtles to have their most successful um, nesting season in more than a decade when the pigs were first introduced. And we'll see some benefits from this project to other species like coconut crabs, which are no longer existent or very, very, very rare on Lucia. Neighboring islands where there are no rats, the coconut crabs are dripping from the trees. Lucia just has rats dripping from the trees. We'll also see the recovery of some of these endemic reptiles. This blind snake only exists on Ulithi, and Lucia provides some of the best habitat for that. There's also an endemic giant gecko and a number of other just beautiful native reptiles on the island and all the islands. And finally, we really we, we expect to see birds resume nesting. That no seabirds nest on Lucia Island where they should. There's a, a coral rubble field where, where ground nesting turns shouldn't be laying eggs and plenty of old growth Pisonia forest, which is just perfect for seabirds, but there are none. And so we hope by removing rats and invasive species, they'll return uh, to nesting and they'll bring those important nutrients like nitrogen with them, which will in turn make a better, healthier forest as well as flow out into the reef. And uh, hopefully we can realize some of the benefits that we've been talking about in the previous islands, such as Titi Aroa and with all of the great work that One People, One Reef has been doing. So this project of, of protecting the Turtle Islands and restoring Lucy up, it's a great stepping stone and to what can be an amazing larger body of work. And I'll just pass it back to you, Junior, to, uh, to wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, really, this has been a um, great early morning for me. I just simply wanted to thank you, you know, a short voice, a small voice from the people of Ulithi, and that's to, to, to reach out to all of you and, and challenge the young people really to, to think outside of the box. You know, if we can do it, if, if there's a glimpse of hope can be done on these tiny strips that you're looking at right now, I 100% sure that others in similar situations would be able to make a difference for their communities. And so our message is, like I said, is one of promise and hope. And uh, we hope that our, our story today has inspired you a little bit. Um, there's a short saying in uh, um, our youth program, how do we uh, learn and nurture local wisdom to influence um, global change? And so I wanna leave you with that but I want to thank you again uh, from the communities of Unity and the Outer Islands and Micronesia. Asachi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wow. A round of applause, I'm sure, from everyone to say thank you so much for sharing your time and your islands and your talents and knowledge with us, all of you, and your stories and thank and your all your voices. So thank you. Um, we have some time for questions, and I don't know, I bet I have a lot, and I know there's a lot of people here who probably have questions, so does anyone want to, you, you can unmute yourselves if you like, and, and ask and answer away, or you can chat some, and I'll monitor.
And uh, if anyone, yeah. If, yeah. You guys wanna, okay. And I, I just wanna point out something that you might not have realized is when there was that video showing in the end, there are turtle tracks, actually. You can see them from the air showing how um, uh, productive it, how, how much the turtles are still accessing that island despite um, you know, the impacts. That, that one was rat free. And the track, oh, it looks like rat someone rat drove a four wheeler all over the island and it's actually a turtle, <laughs> a bunch of turtles. <laughs> Amazing, wow. This is, this is Mark. I was wondering, uh, does the, the, the blind snake have a predator or the introduced species are decimating it? The, the predators to the blind, blind snake, we would imagine primarily to be the in, introduced predators, um, such as rats and monitors, which are both very opportunistic. Um, I don't know enough about blind snake to say for sure whether you know, there's a starling out there that might, Micronesian starlings may consume them. I'm not, I don't know enough. It's only recently been discovered and described. Maybe coral has more insight on that. I don't know. I think probably yeah. some, some of the native lizards might be able to depredate it as well, but it's, it, uh, it's underground primarily, and so you have to kind of dig it up essentially. So um, I think in its native habitat, it really has few predators. Thank you. I have a question for, for Loy. This is uh, Karen. Loy, um, were, were the pictures you showed us on Kyangle with the bananas at, mm -hmm. the, at the very end of your presentation, yes. were there were there very little or no bananas before the rat eradication? I mean, that's a huge change in uh, in harvest. Is that really that dramatic? Yes, it was. When we first arrived in the islands, because uh, it's known for bananas. So every time you go to the I know before when we went to the island, as soon as you arrive, they already uh, like hang it for people to work. But when we arrived uh, with Tommy, they said they had they didn't uh, they couldn't harvest because once they got there the rats already uh, uh, destroyed the bananas so they there was so little bananas that's why I really wanted to show you the difference of how when we first arrived and that's today like that was just a, a three weeks ago like some sort of ceremony they had people going there and they wanted to showcase their bananas so yeah that's. Uh, a difference even Tommy was surprised to see that <laughs> I mean that's that's incredible change in food yeah, security in absolutely yes. incredible change in in food security mm -hmm. that's Thank you. amazing yes Lane, can I ask a follow-up question why it, it is an amazing story could you tell us a little bit now that the eradication has happened um, how biosecurity is going to be handled um, on that, that island to make sure the bananas keep producing and getting used <laughs> by people, not rats. Okay. Uh, yes, I love to answer that because we, as I mentioned, we helped them with the, so they, uh, we helped them with the legislation. So they were able to pass it. And uh, so the governor was, uh, um, was that? To, he was supposed to hire a, a biosecurity officer, which they did in July and uh, or June. The new government, there was a new government, so the new government hired. So now they have um, a biosecurity officer. And uh, so they will be, I think he's still in training. I mean, things are slow in the islands, but at least there's something in place that they can do. So they have an, uh, an officer that's supposed to check the boat when they arrive and they have brochures which they reprinted and I have them here so it's good. The, the youth are really active because they saw the difference and, uh, and they wanted to maintain the uh, and protect their crops. So I, I know they're working hard to do that and uh, making sure the rats uh, don't get to the islands again. I mean, to the boat. Uh, Mm. The Asian rat, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so there's efforts and I'm glad, yeah. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you. So are the islanders managing modern problems like the plastics which are being introduced? Uh, obviously the elders don't have 
stories going back about how the elders dealt with plastics. This is a new problem. Is that uh, of concern? Can they answer yeah. that? <laughs> yes, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's why we're on Skype trying to scream to the world. <laughs> Please stop putting trash in the water. <laughs> we have no way to get rid of it. <laughs> um, we don't have a traditional way of disposing of plastic. Is it a problem? Absolutely. Uh, we're working with um, a couple youth um, uh, students from Nicole's area, California area, to see how we can um, you know, turn some of them into marine debris art. Um, you know, we're working with the local youths to try to get creative with what we can do with what we can, but it is an issue. It is a big issue and we deal with it every single day. So is it stuff that washes up on the beaches or is it imported material and there's just no place for landfill sites and so you need a mechanism of taking the trash off the islands basically. Um, yes. To solve the problem. Yeah, mostly uh, it's a combination of both, but a lot bulk of the trash out there is is marine debris. It it just mm -hmm. washes up. Uh, we don't have uh, any you know too much commercial um, activities happening there to where you know consistent bringing in of too much stuff. Though there is that, uh, but most of it is 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 washed up and you see it all around the islands you know you'll go to turtle islands which is really really remote and then you then there's drink yeah light, lighters out there so we're, we're I trying don't to, think to, yeah, go ahead, to say i don't think there's any pacific islands that don't have lots of washed up marine debris and also if you think about like southeast asia being straight up above um above like especially Ulithi, you can sort of see why that happens. There's a lot of projects going on right now that are looking at the issue of um, waste, both from the perspective of local landfills and the like, but also removing things. And there's actually some projects that are looking at not having it come in the first place. So what are some of the options? And mm -hmm. I think in Micronesia, they have some great projects looking at, um, like re um, making stuff out of like bananas that can be used as mm, plates and yeah. stuff. You know, there's lots of lots of innovation going on, and lots of efforts to to deal with it. So we had a couple things that we've been working on because it's such a huge problem, as as everybody's talking about. Um, one of which is the stopping at the source, which is its own set of things. And the other is what to do with it once it gets there. And, and the two things that we're interested in are making plastic bricks for buildings. So for example, you could build a, 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 most of the trash right now is just set to one side of the island where when a big storm comes through, it blows up. So you could build a, a better place to put the trash. Um, and the other is a, a plastic to fuel conversion machine, which our college has been working on. Um, it's not going to solve the problem of it coming, of course, but once it's there, um, that could be used if, if it works to fuel the boats, which from our perspective, they're little boats, uh, would be useful for marine management because then people can start fishing farther from the places that they're hitting very, very often because fuel is expensive and limited. Wow. Mm. Impressive. Thank you for the question. That really led, that led yeah. to so many places. I didn't even expect that. I guess it's like the trash. You don't know where it's going to go, but yeah. Um, well, we're, so we we're are reach... open to ideas. Hmm? Yes, I said we're <laughs> open to ideas on on those and collaboration on that front. Well, we're reaching the end of our, our journey. We're starting to uh, come into the uh, come into the shore, and I just want to you know thank everyone. Thank everyone who. Uh, you know, got up at 4.30 or earlier to be with us today. Thank you to all our presenters. Thank you, Tommy, Nicole, J Junior, Loyola, and Kate. Um, thank you to all of you today for participating. Thank you for attending and for your interest and your um, happy, you. enthusiastic faces. And I'm sure our presenters all want to say goodbye to you as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, thank you, you everybody. thank you. Bye, long, such thank a you. Thank you, such, such a <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you for being here. Wow, thank that you. was already an hour. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it flew by. <laughs> I'm flies. <laughs>